please give a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Bob Walker. No worries. Am I on, Jim? How are you doing? I have a loud voice, so watch your reverb. Big mouth syndrome, I guess. Good morning. You're very warm and cold and toasty and all that stuff. Um, today, as I said, we've taught a lot of courses in chiropractic and dental and um, work with a lot of dentists in mainly the structural areas as well, as far as establishing proper bite. We've taught at the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, um, the Kmo, yada yada, the whole the little letters we can think of. But my heart is always laid with functional work. I've got a master's degree in neurophysiology and a master's degree in biochemistry before I started this journey. And the whole reason I went into school was to be allowed to practice a lot of the physiologic aspects of what we do. And so it's nice to be here among people that are thinking of the physiologic basis as well as simple structure or aesthetics. So thanks for having me. And today we're going to talk about one of the growing fields of dentistry that is so underappreciated and underutilized, especially when it comes to nutrition and physiology. How many people in here see sleep patients in their office? Everybody. How many people here actually treat them? Great. How many people treat them with acrylic? And that's it. And that's a lot of the problem. It's just like taking out mercury and not supporting the system that's got to detoxify it, you know? Well, when we talk about sleep disorders, there's a bit more to it than the next greatest appliance design or CPAP. There's a time and a place for everything, but it's um, such a fun field to work in and you have more tools than you think. How many people in here were taught how to actually read the sleep studies? Other than conclusion equals needs CPAP. Right? We read studies every day that are telling you step by step by step exactly what you need to do. And the worst thing possible choice you could do is to hyperventilate them. And what's the solution at the bottom conclusion from the medical doctor? Needs CPAP for life. It doesn't make any sense and it doesn't follow the report that we just read. And half of your reports are showing you so much more information than you get. So today, in a very short period of time, we're going to at least try to expose some of the terms and what they mean and what to do about them from a physiologic aspect. Because it's a very, very, very big topic right now. And I think that all dentists should be the forefront in the sleep industry, not second fiddle to a bunch of people that don't have a choice of treatment. And that's a bit frustrating. Now, I do have possible conflicts of interest in that we teach a lot of courses in oral systemic health. Like we have a full oral systemic series leading to a certification in oral systemic health for dental and other professionals. So, and a lot of that stuff people ask me is at exceptionaldentalcourses.com. And out of frustration, we've actually had to source down a lot of nutritional, I've talked with a lot of you, to help treat these things directly without having to go roundabout and finding 14 companies and all these little products and, that are much more focused on what we're trying to do, protocol-based formulas with nutritionals. So I am a co-director of Exceptional Dental Courses. I'm the director of Chirodontics, which has been around for 25 years now. Some of you, we've known for that long, right? <laughs> and we've taken a lot of this stuff and taken all the fluff out and made it focus dental on the Exceptional Dental Course Series. So most of our courses are Exceptional Dental Courses, just to let it out there, and we do do nutrition. But, back to it, it doesn't matter because I'll show you how to use whatever you need to use. At the end of the day, it's information first, how to do it second, right? Why we do it, and then how we do it. But sleep disorders are affecting a large number of people, except 
everybody dumps it into one category. And when you say, oh, I've got a sleep disorder, here's an appliance. That's good for one part of a sleep disorder, not the rest of them. And there's a difference. But it is killing people and really messing with health and life and fun and all this other kind of stuff like that. So what can we do as a profession, multiple professions? We know many of you are treating these patients. Whether you're treating them for sleep or not, you're treating these patients. You know them. They live next door. They ride in the car with you all the time. How many people in here have somebody that snores? Because you never do. It's always them, right? So you never ask a patient, do you snore? You ask their spouse. How many people in here sleep eight to nine hours a night? How many people have the option of sleeping eight to nine a night? <laughs> when you get up at what time is it? But a lot of people can't. They say, oh, well, that's just my sleep cycle. I get up at four o'clock and that's when I get all my work done. That's a cop out. Because that's when you should be getting your most regenerative sleep. You know that, that dream when the alarm goes off by the time you actually get up? You know those last few dreams? They're the best, right? They're supposed to be. When it comes to treating a lot of these patients, it comes down to treatment philosophy. And the people in this room have a treatment philosophy for everything else that falls so perfectly into this field that it is a shame not to let you know. And that's why we're here. Because really, dentists should be the leaders in this field. Now I understand politically we have to let medicine doctors play their game. But let's follow the next step and see what really is there. Especially when it comes to obstructive apnea cases. Now obstructive apnea is a highly overused term. But when we have obstructive apnea, the treatment of choice should be mandibular advancement appliances or mandibular holding appliances. It's not so much that we want to hold a jaw forward, we want to hold it where it belongs while you sleep. It's the falling back that causes problems. But again, that's a small portion of problems. And we can also very simply do orthopedic dental development to open up a lot of the airway and tongue spaces. Structural treatment. Anytime you've got airway and sleep disorders, you've got two choices, right? You can address the symptoms. My gosh, they're not breathing. Let's make them breathe, right? Sit on their chest and pump it. We got you breathing. What if their brain says, I don't want to breathe? No, no, we know better, we're the doctor, right? We can also go in and look at the cause. We can get a couple steps away. In treatment, you always have to ask why three times. You know, oh, I've got apnea, why? And th this is, tw their tissues are swollen, why? They've got excess tonsils, take them out. They stop too quick. You gotta go three whys. That's why they call it three wise men. We've got to get there. But in treatment, you can always create healthy patients or you can create good compensators. Or you can simply mask issues. Now, if you mask the issue, like cutting a pain nerve, right? Ah, you don't hurt anymore. Are you fixing them? No. We want to take another level. So today, we're going to talk about the physiologic aspects of what we see in sleep disorders and sleep studies. Because the information on how to treat is in the take-home studies, it's in the big polysomnograms, the sleep center studies, the information's right there. It's just nobody taught anybody how to read the study. And that is very, very, very frustrating. If we go back all the way to neurophysiology and neuropsychology and back when a lot of these studies and tests were being developed, we learned in graduate school a whole different way to look at these studies. And I can't believe that the sleep industry isn't reading them the way the textbooks actually tell you to read them.
but nobody tells you that. How many people in here use take-home studies in their house, in their office? One, two. They give you so much information. I mean, yeah, I know legally we have to run off and get a sleep center polysomnogram a lot of times in order to treat, and we have to get a little piece of paper that says I am non-CPAP compliant because it will kill me if I take it. And that's okay. The information you get from your own take-home studies is more than just monitoring progress. You get diagnostic and treatment information, but you're not using it. <laughs> A good phrase is, learning is half the battle, unlearning is the other half. And it's nice if you don't know anything, because you can actually learn it the right way. Going back and unlearning it can be very, very frustrating. But every mile you go in the wrong direction is a two-mile error. Actually, it's a three-mile error because you could have been a mile ahead. And now you're just back to zero. But we're going to focus on what you can do for the physiologic issues and really improve the health of your patients. And it, as I said, it is just so underutilized. But most people would rather live with old problems than new solutions. It's easier, you know? Comfortable is better than correct. Everybody in here is already kind of, as we say, you know, sticking their neck on the block every day, which is great. And I said, kindred spirits, we like it. But at present, sleep and airway disorders are done through various take-home studies. Now, one of the things that's easy is having a sleep study, a questionnaire. I mean, there's an old scale of, called the Epworth scale, Australian thing. Um, that, you know, do you fall asleep while you're driving a car? Do you fall asleep while you're watching television? You know, or is the tendency to fall asleep? And, uh-oh, people are falling asleep. <laughs> so I'm so glad we're not after lunch, huh? <laughs> well, those things show things. That's questionnaire. Do you ask? questionnaire on in your patients, do, does your spouse snore, that's the best one, because you never do, but do you fall asleep, to, and do you sleep through the night, do you get eight hours, if you could get eight hours, could you sleep eight hours, no, I can only sleep four hours at a time, that's not good, the questionnaires are screening tools, but they don't give you the guts and meats of how to break it down. If you have patients that present with sleep disorders, but really we look at chronic pain issues because pain messes with sleep. But any altered physiology, toxic patients do not sleep well. And the worst thing you can do for a toxic patient is to hyperventilate them or put them on a CPAP. It is horrible for toxic individuals. Why? Because your liver needs CO2 to process toxins. CO2 is a good thing. Your brain doesn't even care how much oxygen is in your blood to make you breathe. You don't breathe based on how much oxygen you need. You breathe based on regulating CO2 levels. I mean, in severe situations, 68% drop in oxygen your, your arteries, your carotid body, say breathe. That's pretty severe. You're not going to see that. Most of the breathing signals are based on CO2. Too much, too little. Regulating CO2. But one of the things we do is we get a sleep study, a proper sleep study done. And we get these things back from the... Um, oh, I got a green one. <laughs> But we can get sleep studies done that have a lot of information on them. And we can see apneas and central apneas and obstructive apneas and hypopneas and mixed apneas and rheras and foras and all these things like this. But most of the people just say, oh, I've got a report. Conclusion, CPAP. If we actually look at the breakdown of these numbers, they tell us where the problems are. But we have to have other choices of treatment. And appliances and nutrition and a few things like that really start to tell us where to go. 
There's take-home studies that actually display the information a lot better and you can see a lot more in a short period of time and they give you a lot of valid numbers and reasons to treat. And it's one of those tools that's really, really useful. This is a company called Watchpack. That's a real simple, easy one, very comfortable. I mean, has anybody in here ever had a sleep study? Did you go to the sleep center? No. Man, anybody, any of us that's kind of type A personality, can you see us going to a sleep center? You know, putting in your little gown, strapping you with all these wires, wiring you up, putting four cameras on you and saying, okay, go to sleep. <laughs> it's like sleeping in a hut in the middle of Bangkok, right? You're laying there, one eye open, a patch on the other eye, and a switchblade in this hand covered up. Who's busting in this room, right? You're not going to get a, a normal, it's not normal sleep. It's nice if you can go home, have something comfortable, have a normal day and a normal night's sleep and see what happens. Because, like, I've done a sleep study once and, yeah, it's like anybody walks in that room and you're up and ready to go, you know, it's like, hmm. It's not that accurate. But it's nice to see things. Because we can look at things called obstructions or obstructive apneas, which are when you can't breathe. We can look at things that are like central and hypopneas, which are when your brain says, don't breathe. We can look at sleep stages, which is a totally different thing, right? Sleep stages are over here. Nobody wants to treat them. They're the stepchild of sleep medicine. That's what we see all these things on the internet for. Oh, take this, this for sleep stages. You just have to think about it differently. But we can see all the information. There's a little number right there called ODI that tells us how much of this is physiological versus how much is structural. When we start seeing ODIs over three or four, it's a physiologic issue. ODIs of zero, it's pretty much structural. I'll show you on some of the other studies how to pick out some of these numbers. But all those studies give you objective numbers that you can work with, you can measure, you can follow up, and you can monitor progress. And unfortunately right now they're only used to see how well your appliance or CPAP is working. And there's other things you can do. But most people don't even read the study. They do it from a CYA standpoint to stick in a file to justify the appliance or the CPAP. You know? And they say, ah, I've got a sleep study. I can now give them a piece of acrylic. But when you look deeper at the numbers, they're telling you that you need to address the physiology. It's just telling you right there what's going on. So what we're going to do is look at these terms and dissect them a little bit based on the function of the body and what they're actually telling you. I mean, we have the term apnea and then obstructive apnea, which is a type of apnea. We have central apnea and then we have hyponea. What does hypo mean? Less than, right? <coughs> so we have lack of breathing and less than normal breathing. Anybody that ran into the bathroom and back is suffering from hypopnea because it's altered breathing. They go fast and they go slow. It's normal sometimes. The term desaturation oh, drives me crazy. Talk about a misused word. That's it. But I don't feel strongly about that. And then we have an apnea hypopnea index. Talk about a scam. That term was invented to sell CPAP. It was totally invented to sell CPAP. But we can still use it other ways. And then we have sleep stages. As I said, 
poor little sleep stages, we're just going to ignore you because this acrylic will fix it. Now, apnea means when you stop breathing. Everybody take full breath in, half the breath out, and hold. about 10 seconds they're going okay go breathe sorry breathe it's a few you fall down back there you know but how long can you comfortably not breathe without taking a big breath in I mean there's ways to train it right what do swimmers do you know deep free divers anybody here free dive crazy fools um, but how do you free dive you lower your CO2 so much that your brain doesn't know it until the CO2 comes back. In the meantime, you run out of oxygen. But the whole key in free diving is to get is based on CO2 low. High low. Well, you get your CO2 so low that you don't know that it's a problem, you can hold your breath or breathe or do whatever. That's what CPAP does. It doesn't allow CO2 to build up. Or they say take less than 25% of a normal breath. Now that used to be 35. Why do you think they went to 25? It's a whole lot easier to call it apnea, right? For more than 10 seconds. It used to be 15 seconds. Look, we modify the terms a little bit, we make a buck. Who's gonna complain? Obstructive apnea is when you try to breathe, right? Your brain is saying, dude, breathe. But you can't take a breath because something is in the way. It can be a tonsil, it can be a tongue, it can be a jaw. I mean, if your jaw falls back when you sleep, right? You can bring it forward. Like in the daytime, we can just bring our jaw forward, bring our head forward, change our posture, go like this. <sighs> That's better. But when we're lying down at night, we don't have that opportunity. So we can see more obstructions because we want to breathe, but we cannot. So it is a can't breathe issue. Now, obstructions can be, as we said, mandibular position. It can be skeletal airway size. It could be like super narrow nose, broken face, really narrow maxillary arch, really retruded mandible, all these structural things that orthopedics and mandibular position can help. Right? It can be tissue inflammation. We could have a lot of inflammation in the throat. You know, that's why a lot of times after we go out drinking, I wouldn't know, but some of you I saw paint the town green. That night we'd had more inflammation. We also had more relaxed tissues. This is why we see a lot of people with, you know, big necks have a t bigger tendency for it from obstruction, airway size, and inflammation. But a lot of the inflammation that's going on I mean, what's the best way to treat inflammation? Acrylic? Hyperventilation? No. What's the cause of the inflammation? What's a better way to treat inflammation? Cut it out. Right? That'll fix it. Immune system? Bad. Cut it out. We know better. We're the doctor. You do not need lymphatic functioning immune system. We can give you a pill for that. But which is it when we say? Because p jaw position stuff is treated different than narrow arches, which is treated different than tissue inflammation. We have choices. Tissue inflammation is a physiologic issue that is rarely, rarely addressed in sleep kind of scary. <clears throat> when we see obstructions 
from tissue or inflammation or immune system type stuff. That's what we call physiologic obstructive apnea, or POSA. So we have OSA and we have POSA. We get to invent terms too. Central apnea is when your brain says, don't breathe. I know better, don't breathe. No, no, I'm the doctor, I said breathe. No, 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 brain dumb, doctor smart. But central apnea is a neurologic and physiologic mechanism. It's a primitive system. It's based on brain stem. Who's smarter, brain stem or doctor? Doctor, of course. I have a degree. <laughs> now, if we go back to our textbooks, central apnea caused by stroke or congestive heart failure. Stop. That's all they talk about. Stroke, congestive heart failure. We get sleep studies all the time that have a large component of central apnea. Have you had a stroke? Nope. Congestive heart failure? Nope. Well, then you don't have central. Well, we'll give you CPAP anyway. But one of the things that really sets up central is the body's attempt to regulate toxic load. Right? An eco lesion, mercury, liver, environment. Oh my God. People aren't toxic, right? Fluoride, good. Mercury, good. Saves lives. Causes central. Another basic mechanism that's corrected with central apnea is, okay, all of you are gonna go back to physiology. The term, respiratory management of metabolic acidosis. Oh shit, I skipped that day. That's how we regulate metabolic pH. Respiration is a backup way to regulate metabolic acids. It works. To acid, what do we do? Breathe hard. To alkaline, what do we do? Hold your breath. That means you need CPAP. But the whole how we breathe, when we breathe, why we breathe, is based on a feedback with the brain. It's based on levels of CO2 and hydrogen and pH of the blood, and we breathe to regulate that. That's why if we go run and come back, we're breathing hard to regulate that. We're not breathing hard to get more oxygen. We're breathing hard to get rid of CO2. That's just why we do it. So people take oxygen when they're breathing hard. No, just suck out some CO2 and you're better. But strokes and congestive heart failure are not nearly as common as central apnea. Most people with central apnea have not had congestive heart failure or stroke. That simple. But central nervous system feedback, the inhibition or the alterations, chronic alterations, are due to chronic pH regulation. If you're constantly trying to regulate metabolic acid debris, the pH from that, if you're chronically dealing with that, the sensitivity in your brain is going to change. And your speed of feedback is going to change. And if a lot of the receptors that go across the blood-brain barrier are clogged with toxins and metals, which is what happens, then your feedback is much slower. And toxic exposure is one of the biggest causes of central apnea. How many people knew that? Good. How many people know that now? That is one of the biggest indicators to start looking at toxins. Because we see massive central components. Okay, let's start checking what's coming out of the urine. Let's provoke a few things. Let's look at some blood. Because now we'll see it. But central is, I said, a won't breathe issue, and obstructive is a can't breathe issue. Should we treat those exactly the same? No. Then why the heck are we? 
Now to determine the difference, it's all about having a attempt to breathe o meter. Because we can check whether people are breathing or not, and you say, do you want to breathe? But we can check force and flow and attempt, and that's a lot of what that ODI number is all about and that thing. Because, you know, obstructive disturbances, we want to breathe, but we can't. Some of them have chest straps, some of them have, you know, flow. Because if there's no attempt in the mouth to breathe, well, we're not trying. But in our wisdom, we make them. It's not very logical. Now, hyponia, hypopnea, is when you change the rate and depth of respiration between 25 and 70 percent of normal. What the heck does that mean? And what is normal? Who in here is normal? None of us are normal. If you're in this room, you ain't normal. <laughs> Guarantee it. In this room, we're all normal. Yeah. It just means that you're not breathing normally. You're altering your rate and depth of respiration. Now, you have an exciting dream. You're going to have some hypopnea going on. If you're tired, you know, things change as we do it. We see hypopnea during REM. That's normal. But it's not as normal at night, right? When you're sleeping, there should be a pretty normal rhythm. And that's why a lot of what they do is you look at some of the other physiologic mechanisms that are going on to really call it one. But hypopnea is usually acute toxic load, not chronic, acute pH, and minor feedback sensitivity. Hypopneas lead to centrals. If you stick with it for a long time, it's going to get, as soon as it crosses that magic number of 25, you're now central. Because somebody drew a line, right? And the only difference is how long are you having to hold your breath to get the CO2 up for your brain says, okay, it's now time to breathe again to get it down. And that's why testing pH of your patients is one of the simplest things you can do. Mike talked about that yesterday. There's a few things you can do. There's a few modifications in tests. One of the easiest things to do is take somebody's salivary pH, take some lemon juice, get the little thing of real lemon, squirt it in a little cup with a little water, drink it. Wait one or two minutes, check pH again. The pH should jump up a full point. If we're not getting a full point up in alkaline pH, you've got pH issues, reserve issues. When we check for the starting and we check for response. You have to provoke it a little bit, you know? Poke it with a stick, see what happens. And that's a good way to test buffering systems. That's something that everybody in here can do, especially in the hygiene department, right? So simple. We were talking about that. Because if you're not giving that bump up in pH, I guarantee you're also going to have perio problems. And you're going to start having hypopnea problems. The starting point and the response. Now, we do a full week. We make the patient go home and do a week thing with urine and saliva. And you can pretty much tell you where the toxins are coming from and what type of toxins are they. Just from a simple pH. Nothing fancy, but I'll sell you a medical grade pH stick. $29.95 each. Or you get a whole little thing of them. And you can get a whole little pack of them for $10. Simple, easy way to check this stuff out. <clears throat> when we see pH issues, bad pH issues, that's where we want to see, okay, you got toxins. Is the problem that you've got a chronic production of toxins, or is it that you can't get rid of them? And we always say, oh, we're going to detox. Well, you got to support the liver, but a lot of people have one or more of those liver pathways that just don't work. General support just doesn't do it, because you make the ones that are working work harder, and the ones that aren't working still don't work, and more intermediates back up. 
And that makes liver genomic testing or genocentric liver testing much more important. I said, take two days on, okay, here's how you actually look at the way somebody's detoxifying. Where are they weak and how do you support it? There's, in the last five years, there's been so much work on single nucleotide or nucleoprocess um, permutations or disorders, SNPs. And you can have a SNP in an A1A pathway and all of a sudden you've got all this buildup of the wrong estrogens. Because it's all shunning down into the A1, B, A, B1 pathways and you've got all these hydroxyestrogens building up and that causes breast cancer. We know that. General liver support doesn't do it. It actually makes it worse. And so if you've got people that have liver issues and you're going to detox them, you need to know the liver detox pathways for that person and get a little more specific because there's some specific things you can do for each of those pathways to make them work better without causing other issues. But toxic load burden <laughs> and the way the liver works you know, how much is coming out, how does their body process, it, and why, is a real important step in hypopnea. Now, who in sleep is saying, let's look at your liver? Yet. Tomorrow, a different story. But hypopneas are all about pH regulation, and the worse they get, central is all about toxic. I mean, just that simple. Central equals toxic. Hypopnea equals pH. Most people require a term called desaturation to occur to call it a hypopnea. Thank God. Otherwise, we'd all be hypopnic. They're going to probably change this one. They actually have <laughs> in the last couple of months. Desaturation is classified as when you have a 4% drop in oxyhemoglobin. It's now been lowered to 3. Why? Sell <laughs> more CPAPs. But a 4% drop in oxyhemoglobin. Now, when your hemoglobin is carrying oxygen, can your tissues use it? You know? What do your tissues need in order to be able to use oxygen that you're carrying? It needs to be delivered, right? So it needs to be given up to tissue. So when our hemoglobin desaturates, we have more tissue oxygen. How many people say, oh, desaturation, you've got low blood oxygen. Oxyhemoglobin is bound, you can't use it. When it's delivered, oxygen goes up. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. We all desaturate, but it's only a backup. This is the warehouse. But it's usually measured with pulse oximeters. How many people use pulse oximeters in their practice? Another awesome tool, but totally misused. Do you think it's measuring blood oxygen? No. It's not. It's not a measure of oxygen in the blood. Hemoglobin is never desaturated. It's always resaturated with something else, right? We either have oxyhemoglobin, we have carbon dioxyhemoglobin, we have glucosylated hemoglobin, we've got mercury oscillated hemoglobin, and we've got hydrogenated hemoglobin. The pulse oximeter is just beaming a light in there and saying, okay, how much of that is arterial blood? versus venous blood, right? Because venous blood is pretty much carbon dioxinated. Arterial blood should be primarily oxygenated, right? The capillary is kind of hard to tell you that. Main artery, much easier. Circulation, what's one thing that can really mess with a pulse oximeter? Bad thyroid. Why? Peripheral circulation sucks. 
So these things can mess with what we're dealing with here. It is a tool. It's a useful tool. It's not telling you anything. You got to use your brain. Right? But popular thinking is that pulse oximeter is telling you blood oxygen. The problem with popular thinking is it doesn't require you to think. Right? You hope somebody else thought it out for you that had no financial gain. But desaturations measuring the amount of hemoglobin in your capillary bed that is bound to oxygen. Does tell you things, right? Hemoglobin is an oxygen carrier. It's going to release oxygen as needed, but it does not get its signal from low oxygen. Right? You release oxygen in order to take up something else. The driver for desaturation is hydrogen, CO2, and metal. <laughs> and sugar, right? Blood sugar is a biggie. But it's a really good buffer. Hemoglobin is called a protein buffer. It's good at certain pH ranges, and it carries things out of the body. It's a wonderful buffer. Desaturation of hemoglobin is rarely, rarely, rarely caused by low blood oxygen. 68%. Look at, you know, Guyton physiology, go back to the thing, you'll see an oxygen dissociation curve, and it'll be 68% oxygen causes hemoglobin to give up oxygen. Whereas a 3% change in CO2 causes desaturation. That's physiology, not opinion. Right? That's... Where's the research on that? This is from the 50s and 60s. This isn't even contested. But we have an apnea. All the apneas that occur at night, plus the hypopneas, all the hypopneas that occur at night, which just increased because they dropped it to 3%, right? You want to get that number up change the percent one point. The total number of apneas plus hypopneas divided by the hours of sleep. Sleep less hours, you got it higher too, right? <laughs> Keep waking them up. <laughs> That's why sleep centers where you sleep shorter time period tend to have higher scores than take home studies where you sleep longer in your own bed because it spreads it out. Yeah? But total apneas plus hypopneas per hour of sleep. That's how many events per hour, right? That's good to know, right? Zero to five events per hour is considered normal. Five to 15 events is considered mild. 15 to 30 is moderate. And over 30 is severe events per hour. We see a number of 30 and people say, oh, you have severe apnea. No, you have a severe apnea hypopnea index score. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you've got bad apnea and you're going to die without CPAP. They could be all hypopneas. They could be all centrals. If 30 events per hour are central and you stick somebody on a CPAP, that is the silliest bloody thing you can do. If they're all obstructive apneas and it's due to airway size, CPAP might be the smartest thing you can do for a while. But it's totally based upon the breakdown. I mean, it's an alarm bell, but doesn't tell you what to do. It combines centrals, it combines obstructives, and hypopneas into a single score. Why do they do that? It makes the number bigger. <coughs> but it can be very, 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 very misleading. It doesn't always tell you what you want to know. The treatment for central, obstructive, and hypopneas are totally different. Totally different mode of treatment. If the bulk is from central or a hypopnea, don't expect to get this magical result from a CPAP. CPAP makes central worse. Mandibular advancement devices, you're not going to get that much result 
with a hypopnea or a central. You might get some because you're allowing better respiration and oxygen exchange and CO2 blow up. So we look at a lot of these little tests and stuff like that and we can see how much is central. Like this study here is all central. Conclusion. Need CPAP. Why? It's all I got. Right? If you go to a surgeon and ask them what you're going to do, what do they say? Surgery. Right? You go to a nutritionist and ask them what you're going to do. Nutrition. Go to a general dentist and ask them what they're going to do. You're fine. Never mind. Or they'll call the, the AGD. What do I do? What do I do? But AHI is a good marker for if issues are there. Like I said, it's a red flag. When the AHI is up, it's a red flag. The next question is, what is the breakdown? How much of this score is central? How much of this is obstructive? And how much of this is simply hypopnea based on desaturation score that just got lowered to make the number higher? Now, you separate out obstructives, and then from obstructives, we separate out inflammation from mechanics, right? If you have events that have a lots of obstruction and very little inflammation, then you're going to get a really good result with a mandibular appliance or a CPAP. But this inflammation is going to get in your way. And this is why often with appliances, they'll put them where their jaw wants to be, and then what do they do? Forward, 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 forward. Because if I put my foot on your forehead and pull your mandible forward, I open your airway. Right? Me doctor, me smart. You're overcoming inflammation with position. You're treating the wrong issue. You see a case here. Obstructive apnea is 382, hypopnea is 0, central is 27. That's a good time to use an appliance, right? It looks pretty much all obstructive. Now there could be some inflammation in there, so appliance and inflammation treatment, you're going to get a really good result. And we look over here at the apnea hypopnea index. Holy bejeebers. When we see scores over 100, you might, can, okay, then they're justified in saying, we don't want you to die. Let's put you on a CPAP for a while until we get things under control, right? So then you get to be Darth Vader, right? Oh, apnea hypopnea. Of course, get a new bedroom, right? But we start to look at desaturation indexes and some of these other scores to tell us how much else is going on. So we can look at studies from obstructive, central, and hypopnea and pretty much predict how good of results we're going to get with an appliance, how much nutrition we need. We see scores, as we showed before, that are all central. Don't expect hypnea, you know, um, CPAP to help central. The poor child called sleep stage disturbances is totally separate from all of those obstructive and AHI scores. This is when the stages are disrupted. Now we look at REM, we look at non-REM, and non-REM we look at light and deep. We also look at onset times and REM onset time and does REM increase? REM starts out short and in each cycle REM gets longer and longer and longer. The last two cycles of sleep, REM is the longest. That's why you tend to remember your last dreams more because they're longer, they're more colorful, more vivid. REM is much more active in the last two sleep stages. So we can do how much is sleep and wake in a study and out of the sleep, how is it broken down into REM, light, and deep sleep? You should have 25% at least of your sleep in REM. This should be a quarter if not more. A 25% should be REM. And the deep sleep is all about regeneration and healing. 
the light sleep, you're ready to jump up and slay the dragon at a moment's notice. We see some breakdowns in different reports where we start to see like no deep or no REM. Look at this ODI. That is screaming, please treat my physiology. Conclusion on the study? Need CPAP. But for proper sleep to occur, you have to have a sympathetic and parasympathetic balance. You know? You need to really have good parasympathetic tone. Now, in the old days, we were always taught that, you know, sympathetic up, parasympathetic down. There's, you know, like a teeter-totter, right? Not true. They're totally independent scales. If you have a high sympathetic, it does not mean your parasympathetic are low. They can both be up, both be down, one be normal, one up, one down. Sleeping is all about parasympathetic tone, not sympathetic tone. What you want is normal sympathetic and high parasympathetic tone when you're sleeping. But one of the things that really drops parasympathetic tone, nighttime cortisol and nighttime blood sugar and excessive nighttime liver function. How many people wake up at three or four in the morning? All right? You gotta go do the pee pee dance, you know? That trot or that wake up call at four o'clock in the morning is when your liver is taking ammonia making urea. Most active time for that. It's a classic wake up call for ammonia. And if you actually would check the wake up call urine, it can be really alkaline. Why? Because you're just making ammonium because your chemistry's off. Your liver can't deal with the load. This is when kids bed wet too. And adults, but um, it depends. But when you're sleeping, parasympathetic tone should be highest. Is it? We can measure sympathetics and parasympathetics while you're sleeping with a heart rate variability if we want. We can also look at the tones and provocations just in the office. How many people in here use heart rate variability? How many people use heart rate variability? Because it tells you more than you think. Well, I know you guys, so I know you use it. You get so much information out of it that people don't use. How many people have heart rate variability but it's in a closet somewhere? But HIV is great for that. We can check supine, we can check upright, we can check sympathetics and parasympathetics, we can poke it with a stick, we can see how well their system responds, we can tell whether it's a structural issue, emotional issue, nutritional issue, toxic issue. We can tell whether it's an ascending issue or a descending issue in about five minutes. And we can do a 24-hour one now. And we're syncing the 24-hour heart rate variability with WatchPat, if any of you have both. Because you don't need to get the halter monitor, which is about another three grand. But we can see what happens during sleep and during awake. When things normalize during sleep, and they're all screwed up when you're awake, that's called daily stress. And you ain't doing it too well. But physiology and neurology is pretty good. So you can tell when people are just stressed out in the head, cortex, right? Cortex of the brain works with the cortex of the adrenals. Medulla of the brain works with the medulla of the adrenals. So you can tell whether it's a cortisol problem or an epinephrine problem. Adrenals are not just cortisol. We can monitor nighttime fluctuations. So a lot of people have HRV, a lot of people don't use it. <laughs> but ideally, parasympathetic nervous system should be up, sympathetic should be normal. Parasympathetic tone is the only way you're going to get deep sleep. 
And that's why autonomic balance is one of those things that makes such a big difference in sleep stages, which is why most people don't want to talk about sleep stages because it's about the autonomics and it's about hormones. Sleep stages equals autonomic balance, right? Obstruction equals jaw position. Central equals toxic burden. Hypopnea equals pH. Sleep stage equals autonomics. How simple. You just have to have the tools to play with that. Most common cause of low parasympathetic activity is cortisol and thyroid problems. But the rest of the hormones are important. So that's why we take two days and let's talk about hormones. We can look at cortisol rhythms. Totally screwed up rhythms are going to mess with your morning, your daytime, your digestion, your gut system, your whole detox patterns. And it's so easy to test. They're not that difficult. And hugely important. So why should a dentist be checking for hormones? Well, you can always call it immune system or inflammation or something. But sleep is one of those reasons to do it. Because nobody else is going to do it. Toxic load is going to affect sleep. Big another reason. We look at sleep stages. We look at desaturations. We look at snoring and positions. We've got a lot of information we can get off of these little sleep studies. See these little red bars here? REM, REM, REM. See these black things that drop down? Desaturations, desaturations, desaturations. Desaturation during REM equals toxic. That simple. Why? In REM, your CO2 sensitivity changes. You're going to dump your oxygen. You're going to get rid of as much stuff out of your blood as you can. And that massive desaturations during REM is usually not CO2. It's other stuff. Desaturation during REM equals toxic. Classic. And often that makes people wake up and not dream much. So what do we do? We put a CPAP on them. What does that do? Saturates the hemoglobin so that it cannot desaturate. So now what happens? You cannot regulate your CO2. Is that a good thing? Makes the number better, right? It makes the score great because all hypopneas are gone and all centrals are gone because <laughs> you don't have a choice, right? You know? You're breathing whether you like it or not. From studies, you got a really good view of what's happening in sleep. You know? Do we have a red flag for AHI? Is it central or obstructive? Measure it. All we have sleep, do we have sleep stage disturbances? Totally different. The bigger question is what are you going to do about it, right? In the end, it comes down to one real issue, and that's called physiology. You know? In the notes online, I gave you a lot of extra just because I was feeling fun and generous. Because I knew we wouldn't really get to be able to get into a lot of the stuff like that. But as you can see, there's a large physiologic component to most of what we're doing especially with obstructions. OSA is one of the things that you want to get in to start treating because you can't breathe, you know? But so much of OSA is inflammation. And what can we do with inflammation, right? When we see Mixed apnea is being the most. What does that mean? Obstructive and mixed means they kind of got a little of both. But obstructive events, you do your basic dental orthopedic problems because they get your foot in the door. It gets patient compliance. They're your patient. You're treating them for obstruction. And it's easy. Then you want to support physiology, especially when it comes down to inflammation. Now, 
I gave you some good stuff on inflammation. Like I said, I gave you a lot of extra stuff. So definitely go and download the stuff because we gave you a lot of extra goodies to help you out here. Because I want you to, you know, in one hour, what the heck can you do, you know? I find your horse can ride for a little bit, you know? But um, there's more that you can learn. I said, we do it in two full days. But there's a lot of tests you can run to get into it. Do you guys run inflammatory marker tests in your stuff? Well, what's the most basic inflammatory marker test you can run? CRP, right? High sensitivity CRP is now blood spot. High CRP means inflammation somewhere. Could be perio, right? That's why often, while you're treating a lot of this perio stuff that's going on, that's the best time to deal with the inflammatory markers in the system. Perfect reason to use nutrition. We look at homocysteine, old studies. Not as accurate, easy to change the numbers without making them healthy. Look at complete blood counts. You guys do just CBCs? Most people have them. You can tell a lot. We look at the lipid profiles. How many people in here get their cholesterol checked? And we talk about HDL and LDL like their cholesterol. That's a good number, that's a bad cholesterol. But neither one's cholesterol, right? They're lipoproteins. No sterol ring in those babies. Totally different. Triglyceride to HDL will tell you about blood sugar really fast without even having to run insulin tests. But we can look at HbA1c, blood spot again. Classic example, we look at the saturation statistics on a sleep study. Anytime somebody's average saturation is below 95%, that's because 5% of that blood is glycosylated. Once glucose sticks on hemoglobin, that hemoglobin is glycosylated until it's dead. So it takes 120 days to make new blood cells. Don't expect HbA1c to change for at least two months. It's a slow changer. Why? Because those cells cannot carry oxygen anymore. So now they're chronically desaturated. What does that do? Woohoo! Raises AHI. What does that mean? CPAP. They're undiagnosed, insulin resistant, glycosylated hemoglobin patients being treated with hyperventilation. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Every day. But we can check these things. But any markers are up, you have inflammation. We can address stuff with broad spectrum nutrition. General inflammation, right? So easy to do. Or we can get real specific from product placement. <laughs> we got a lot of stuff that we designed just to do that. Now, but if you look at what's in it, you can get anywhere. But you want quality stuff. What do we want? You want quality EPA and fish oil. If you go and get fish oil, Number one, you want small fish, not big fish. You want lowest on the chain, not highest mercury accumulation fish. And look at it. How many people take fish oil and they burp up a flavor? You know, you kind of feel like a penguin for a while. <laughs> not a good thing, you know. How much EPA plus DHA is in the capsule? <coughs> Don't even look at anything that's not 50%. Right? Don't even look at it. If it's 40%, it means you got 60% worth of fish poop. Because it ain't EPA, DHA. Ideally, you want it up to about 75% EPA, DHA out of a cap. Say, I've got a gram capsule that's got 30% EPA, DHA in it. What's the other 70%? We don't want to know. But you don't want to eat it either, you know? Ours is 950 out of a gram. Much better. <laughs> you can also use a lot of broad spectrum anti-inflammatories. This is the gingers, the curcumin, curries work really good for that. Cayennes work really good for that. Oswilla, there's a lot of things you can put in those systems that are really nice natural anti-inflammatories. They're not suppressing the inflammation, they're helping clear debris. <laughs> if you want to get deeper into causes, 
<coughs> that's where you can get more specific. Getting deeper into the system is where we really have to start to break down allergies and immune systems. And we can test allergies. We can test immune systems. We cannot test and treat allergies and immune systems with nutrition. It's nicer if you know which specific. I like to target, but you can also use really nice broad spectrum stuff for allergies and immune systems. And I would love to spend a day with you going through how to look at and how to test allergies and immune systems. And how to get into a lot of these things and how to really break down sleep stages. And that's why I said each one of those little areas dealing with things like really understanding the whole sleep world. You know, fundamentally that's a couple days. Not a couple years, it's a couple days. Really understanding the liver like you guys are already there, but getting more specific with up-to-date liver genomics and what's going on and how we can really target treatment, not just take it out. I and mean, a lot of people, we see a lot of stuff in here, how to protect the doctor. <laughs> Who's protecting the patient? You know, we take stuff out, but it's got too clear. And everybody has a specific weakness in their clearance. We want to know those things. Sleep stages and these other things. Hormones. Clean her. Hormones have a lot of problems. How many people have hormone problems? No. Rephrase. How many people's partner has hormone problems? <laughs> Tell me later. Because <laughs> you get these elbow pains, right? How many people in here have sore ribs? <laughs> it's an important topic. And taking a good look at the autonomics. I mean, these things take some time to learn, but I just think it's a great step. And what I want to try to do this weekend is just get you guys, I know they're going to probably give me a flash here in a second, because, you um, is to take a look at sleep and at studies and start to break it down, right? Purely obstructive. No inflammatory markers. Appliances are awesome, right? And you don't need a lot else. Big obstructive scores with inflammatory markers means inflammation, allergies, and the immune system. And there's a lot we can do for inflammation, allergies, and the immune system. And actually in the full notes that are online, I gave you guys a lot of specifics if you want to play with it. We are generous. Central apnea, man, you'll see toxic. That is when you really get aggressive with dealing with toxins. And you'll watch central apneas clear up. Uh, hypopneas with desaturations is all about pH regulation. Deep cell pH, cell fluid pH, vascular pH, different mechanisms at work, right? Has nothing to do with CPAP. Appliances might help a little, but don't expect this massive improvement. And when we get to the sleep stages, think hormones. Think regulating the system. And desaturations in REM equals toxic, right? Some little pearls that you can use. Download and go back and read the rest of them, because we give you some specifics. But if you want to get into using nutrition in these areas, come talk to us. If you want to learn more about how to specifically apply it, come talk to us. If you don't want to, come talk to us. We'll have a beer. Challenge our load. And then have a look at what you're doing in the rest of your practices. Because I know Michael talked about it and Phyllis talked about it. Nutrition is such a good adjunct into what you're doing. Treating patient physiology like you are is good. Take it another level. There are some ways we can take it another level to help the whole system. And we're going to let you guys go or have any questions right now. But thanks for having me.